morning, everyone. I think uh, I think we'll get started. I apologize for the late start. Uh, I'm Rob Atkinson. I'm president of, of ITIF, and uh, we're really honored and pleased today to have a, an event to talk with Ed Luce, uh, who is the author of a really wonderful new book, uh, Time to Start Thinking, America in the Age of Dissent. And uh, I tend to not like books. Um, uh, not that I don't read them. I, I tend to not like most books uh, who write write about this kind of stuff because I, I find most of these books are um, kind of vapid and shallow and uh, not really very incisive. I mean, it just I think that's just the way people write because that's how you get on Amazon. Um, and Ed's book is very different than that. Um, to me, what I really liked about Ed's book, besides the fact that he quoted me, uh, to me this mark of a really really good book. Um, um, what I really like about Ed's book is, is really two things. One is, um, uh, I think Ed, Ed, as you'll hear in a minute, is not an American. <laughs> Maybe you are, but you weren't born in America. And so I think he has an insight, uh, almost a de Tocquevillian de insight into the U.S. and where we are that I think a lot of other people have missed. And, and I, I, that really came through the book. And the other part of the book that I really liked is, um, both his access to people, I mean, he had access to really talking to really uh, you know, important people, uh, but also just sort of people around the country and really getting a sense of how people are feeling in the U.S. and what's going on. So um, I was, um, when we put this on our website, I got an email from a colleague, who I won't say in another country, and, and um, uh, the colleague said, are you going to publish a transcript of this thing, and you know, can I watch it online? I said, yeah, you can, and, and they may be watching now, and they said, and, and they said, um, Ed is talking about something that everybody else in the world sees and understands except the U.S. I think that was an interesting comment that, that a lot of people outside, when I talk to them, sort of see what Ed is writing about it. They talk to me about it, but it seems like we're the last place to kind of get it. So, Ed, do you want to... I, actually, let me uh, I should back up and, and read your bio just very briefly. Um, and then you can talk a, bit, a little bit about your book. We'll have a little dialogue and then we'll open it up and we'll adjourn um, at 1.30, if not before. Uh, Ed is the U.S. The chief U.S. commentator for the for the FT, the Financial Times. Uh, he writes a weekly column on U.S. politics, economy, and foreign policy. He was also prior to that head of the U, the Washington bureau chief for the FT. Uh, he also worked in the South Asia bureau chief in Delhi, um, and uh, authored a book uh, around India called "In Spite of the Gods: The Strange, Strange Rise of Modern India" in 2006. Uh, he also, from 99 to 2001, was a speechwriter for Larry Summers uh, when Summers was Treasury Secretary uh, and has a degree in uh, politics, philosophy, and economics from Oxford. So, Ed? Thank you, Rob, for that there. Can you hear me? you got to kind of more time to the screen. Okay. There you go. Um, okay. Thank you for that, that really kind of introduction. And I, I ought to also add that not only you quoted, but the some of the research, the thinking, uh, and the the intellectual um, work you've done at ITIF was really, really helpful for my book and the conversations that we had. Uh, you know, only one of which I very briefly cited. I know journalists are always very unfair. They talk to hours for people and then give uh, ten sec one ten second quote, and that's Rob falls squarely into that category. So thank you so much for that. Also for for hosting this. Um, I, I won't give the sort of full Monty version of this book, uh, you know, authors tend to get a bit obsessional and think that nothing else matters. Um, uh, I had my mother on the phone the other day and she, uh, she asked me how the book was going and I said, uh, and I responded and 45 minutes later she said, I really regret asking you <laughs> <laughs> that question. Um, so I'll, I'll give you the, the, the short, it's slightly longer than the elevator version, but uh, a, um, a relatively short 15, 20 minute summary of, of, of where I'm going with this book couple of caveats to start with. The first um, uh, is that this isn't quite as suicidally depressing as it might sound from the, uh, from the title um, and the subtitle in particular, America in the Age of Dissent. Uh, in, in fact, the subtitle in non-US versions published outside of the US and Canada, the different publisher is America in the Spectre of Dissent, which I think more accurately re reflects um, the nuance of, of my book. Um, nevertheless, it's not it's not um, a totally uplifting book. It's not going to make you want to frolic with the spring lambs. Uh, the New York Times, in its otherwise very generous cover review of my book a couple of uh, months ago, 
um, suggested it wasn't so much time to start thinking as time to start drinking. Um, and uh, and I, whilst I understand that sentiment, it, it doesn't it, it doesn't explain the whole book. Second brief caveat is, as Rob has pointed out, I'm, I'm not delivering this in an accent that's that's ideal for marketing such a message uh, about the United States to people from the United States. Um, uh, so I ought to just I hope a little bit establish my credentials. I'm aware that there are many many Brits, many people with whom I share a passport who um, are either over adulatory about the United States um, or, or indeed sneering. Um, one end of the spectrum or the other seems to seems to describe a lot of my countrymen from uh, the first end of the spectrum, you know, prime ministers urging you into dubious wars of choice um, or indeed Harvard, uh, Harvard academics uh, urging America to, to, to very self-consciously take up the Baton as the last declared imperial um, English-speaking power. Um, I, I, I'm, I feel rather awkward to share a passport with them. Equally, um, at the other end, um, uh, Samuel Huntington once, um, the late Samuel Huntington once um, defined as an Amer American declinist um, in response to Paul Kennedy, a compatriot of mine's famous book in the late 1980s. Huntington defined an American declinist as somebody who actively wishes for America's decline, which I think was a bit un unfair to Paul Kennedy, but by that definition, I certainly wouldn't be a declinist. Um, uh, if if I'd been around in uh, in 1956 when the United States, when Eisenhower um, pulled the plug from what remained of um, British power over the Suez crisis, I'd like to think I would have been cheering Eisenhower on as as having made the right decision, um, and if uh, as long as it's not starring. Mel Gibson, then um, any movie that I see that involves a fight between the Colonials and the Redcoats, I'm usually um, with the Colonials. <coughs> Mel Gibson does, does offer a big exception to that, though, I have to say. <laughs> um, and indeed, if I were to write a book about the condition of Britain nowadays, I'm sorry to say that a reviewer might well spoof it as time to start sniffing glue, because the problems that you face in the United States are even... Uh, worse in some respects in the United Kingdom, and and Britain I think has fewer resources on which to draw, which to draw, not least um, the international reserve currency that that remains the U.S. dollar. Um, so to the book, um, I um, don't really want to talk about relative economic decline because I think this is a natural and inevitable phenomenon. Um, but I will make this point just as a preface that um, I have in, in, in recent columns for the FT once or twice picked on uh, an author I otherwise greatly admire, uh, Robert Kagan um, from the Brookings Institution and of course also um, an advisor to the Romney campaign. Um, much of whose work I do greatly admire. I think um, uh, Dangerous Nation is a brilliant work of history about America in the, in the 19th century. Um, but his recent book, The Myth of America's Decline, was something I did pick on because it, it begins with the premise that America's relative share of global GDP at a quarter um, has remained remarkably steady, remarkably steady in his words, for the last generation or so. It begins in 1969 and takes us right up to 2011. And the president picked up on an extract of this book that ran in the New Republic um, and cited... Uh, at least his thoughts, if not the book by name, in his State of the Union speech this January, where he said, anybody who talks of America's decline doesn't know what they're talking about. And Kagan was really the um, source um, source of that, of that sentence. Um, and his numbers are just simply wrong. Um, if you look at um, any normal measure of global share of GDP, either through um, annual market exchange rates, or indeed... Um, if you if you want through purchasing power parity for the non exchange rate values, then America's share has been declining quite sharply. In 1969, the year Kagan begins, it was about 36 percent of global GDP according to the IMF. By 2001, it was down to 31 percent. Not a huge dilution, um, but between 2001 and 2011, 
um, it fell from 31% to 23.5%, which is, a, I think, by any historical standards, a very, very rapid dilution. Um, and, of course, one that was mostly due to with the rapid growth in countries like China, India, and the other BRICs. Um, and I, as I say, I don't think this is a bad phenomenon. This is a world in which when other people get richer or less poor, um, there are more opportunities for the United States. Economics is not a zero-sum game. Um, my book focuses on America's response to this at many levels. Very complex, interrelated set of challenges that are associated with the impact of globalization on the American economy, of, of hyper-globalization, really, that we're seeing um, uh, um, now, and the associated impact, and perhaps more important one, of exponentially changing technology. And America's response, the famous sense of pragmatism that, that de Tocqueville uh, identified as an American quality, and indeed is an American word, has been missing in action over the last few years to the extent there has been a response to these challenges. Um, they have tended to, to exacerbate them. The political system um, is by no means responding um, to America's relative economic decline in a pragmatic way. Um, so there are three points I'd like to really um, highlight from the book. The book is a reported work, and as Rob says, I, I do a lot of traveling uh, beyond the Beltway. It's not principally a Beltway, he said, she said book. It looks at different sectors of the American economy from the ground. But if I were to um, give you an abstract of the three, um, of, of the three most important uh, interrelated themes um, that go to making up an American descent, or at least the specter of American descent, uh, they would be as follows. First, um, the Latin Americanization of the American e economy. Um, now, um, I think we're all aware of the fact that, uh, although there's still some dispute about the significance of the numbers, we're all aware of the fact that the um, uh, American labor market has been suffering from median wage stagnation, in the phrase of economists, for, for about a generation, really since the 1970s, that the wages of the median household um, the earnings of the median household have only gone up to the extent that women have entered the labour force and in, indeed have only gone up to the extent that they have become two earner households from being one earner household in the 1970s. Um, I think what people are less aware of um, is the degree to which that trend is deepening and accelerating over time. So between 2002-2007, the last full business cycle, um, the median household income actually dropped for the first time in America's history. Um, uh, and so was lower at the end of the cycle than at the beginning to the tune of $2,000, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, and uh, the fact that since 2009, we're now three full years into the current recovery, um, we, um, we see um, uh, the median household income dropping with each year of the recovery, in other words, lower each year into the recovery than it was before, which again is a new and accelerated um, phenomenon. Um, so 6.4% uh, poorer, um, to be precise. Um, and of course, incomes always drop in a recession, but we're not used to recoveries where um, the bulk of the labour force sees lower incomes during the recovery than they uh, started with at the beginning of it. Um, and the Latin American quality to this is the degree to which growth is being distributed um, to different parts of society. Um, in 2010, which was the first full year of this recovery, and so far uh, the strongest and likely to remain the strongest, was 3% growth in the US in 2010. 93% um, of the gains of that growth went to the top 1%. Um, uh, more, moreover, um, the top 0.1%, the top um, one, 1 in 10,000 families, um, uh, 1 in 10,000 Americans, and the top 1,500, uh, 15,600 families, the wealthiest 15,600 families in America, took almost 40% of growth in 2010, um, uh, according to Emmanuel Seitz and Thomas Piketty. Thomas Piketty, incidentally, is now an advisor. Um, to President Hollande in France. 
Um, uh, this is a, a, a skewing that America last saw during the Gilded Era. Um, and it's also a skewing that you would normally associate with the Latin American distribution of growth. And I'd say normally associate because if you look at the performance of Brazil in the last few years and Mexico, um, you will see a, a decreasingly Latin American um, model in operation there. Mexico, quite extraordinarily, has had two budget surpluses since 2007. Um, and has posted a very, very good growth. Um, so that Latin American pattern um, is something that is now, I think, uh, far better illustrated in the way the American economy is working today. Um, and what do we think of when we talk about Latin American politics? The classic Latin American model <coughs> is a shift from populism to orthodoxy and back again in great destabilizing lurches. Um, and I don't need, uh, I think, to tell you um, uh, remind you, sitting uh, here we are a mile away from Capitol Hill, that the um, quality of American politics um, in the last few years has declined, I think, alongside these trends. And I very much argue, and I think there's a great deal of evidence to show, that the polarization in the economy, the bifurcation, the hollowing out of the middle class, whatever you choose to call it, um, is very much linked with um, and reinforced by um, the polarization that we're seeing in the political sphere. The two are very, very much going hand in hand. Um, second point, one um, more squarely in, in, in Rob's court, um, is that uh, the competitiveness in aggregate of America, I mean, I've been talking in the first point about the distribution of growth, that doesn't necessarily have an impact on how much growth um, America can generate. Um, the competitiveness of America is often seen to be um, distinct from, um, or in the words of economists, exogenous to the health of America's political economy. In other words, the golden goose will keep, keep on laying the golden eggs, regardless um, of how dysfunctional Washington is. Um, Silicon Valley is Silicon Valley, and it's, it's outside the realm of um, what politicians are doing. Um, and I very much see that as incorrect. Um, I think the evidence, and Rob would agree with this, the evidence here is, is uh, against that. Um, if you look um, at the uh, American trade um, numbers in the last 20 years, um, you'll see uh, the US beginning in the early 1990s with a strong surplus in trade in advanced manufacturing products, not the cheap commoditized stuff which was inevitably going to leave America's shores, but the most high-tech stuff. America was roughly in balance at the beginning of the Clinton era. By the end of the Clinton era, it was in deficit. Uh, by the time China joined the WTO, it was in deficit to the tune of about 40 billion annually. Now it's more than 100 billion, I think I'm correct, in saying. So the high value added, the sort of cognitive end, if you like, of production, um, America's terms of trade keep getting worse. Um, and uh, if you look at the composition of the export um, increase you've seen in the last few years, um, a huge bulk of this is commodities. There's been commodity price booms um, across the board. These are the kinds of products, um, you know, whether it's corn from Iowa or soybean, whatever it, it might be, that you would normally associate with, with a less developed economy. Um, so Silicon Valley is, of course, the, the trump card. Um, for, for anybody um, worrying about American competitiveness. There is no doubt that there is no other economy in the world that has anything like Silicon Valley. And I doubt in the, in the near future, um, uh, or perhaps at all, there will be an equivalent to Silicon Valley in places like China, even in India um, or, or in Europe. There, there is so much unique about American culture that goes up to making this entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, and there is so much unique in, in a culture that says, um, I just went bankrupt last week and can boast about it. There are, there are cultures in East Asia for which it's still a deep badge of shame. And it's hard to imagine this transforming itself. Um, so I'm relatively confident about America's ability to remain the world's leading innovator. Again, though, set against where America was um, and where Silicon Valley was, um, even 10 years ago, there are some disturbing trends. Um, ITIF, I think, um, has um, a survey of, 
um, since the turn of the century um, ranking of countries um, in terms of what they've done to boost their innovative environment. And America comes 40th out of a list of 40 countries on that. The steps that um, the US has taken, um, Washington in particular, to uh, make entrepreneurialism a more expensive, more risky prospect. Um, uh, it's quite a long list and it's getting longer. I won't, um, I won't uh, uh, give you that full list, but Sarbanes-Oxley obviously makes it much less attractive because it becomes much more expensive to go public. We've seen a shrinking in, in the number of IPOs in the last 10 years. There are uh, more than a third fewer listed companies on American <coughs> stock exchanges today than there were in the late 1990s. This again is a unique trend um, because pretty much every year um, up until the late 1990s, America would increase the absolute number of listed companies. Now, some of some of the um, some of some of these companies are being um, acquired by larger companies. Um, some, you know, are relying on angel investors um, and never go public. Um, but there is also evidence to show a shrinkage of venture capital. A lot of evidence, in fact, to show a shrinkage of venture capital. Um, available not just in America as a whole but in, in Silicon Valley in particular. In the late 1990s the Silicon Valley Venture Capital Association reported 200 billion dollars um, in uh, VC fundraising. Now a lot of that was froth and bubble um, and a lot of it deserved to evaporate um, after the pet foods dot com excesses of, of, of the late 1990s but a lot didn't um, and since 2000, there's never been one year in which more than $25 billion um, was raised. Um, uh, and if you talk to my brother-in-law and sister-in-law live in Silicon Valley, so I'm there quite a lot. In fact, I was there just this weekend. But if you talk to VCs involved um, in sectors other than social media, and perhaps after Facebook, even including parts of social media, um, the, the, the optimism that you associate with Silicon Valley is strikingly absent. It's strikingly absent. Um, the opportunities that are arising in other parts of the world um, are, of course, at heart of the story. That's the good news side of the story. That explains why a lot of students who graduate from Ivy League, etc., go home. They probably would have gone home anyway. But there is another side to this coin, and the other side to this coin um, is that America is at the same time as the rise of others taking steps that make it less competitive, albeit from the pinnacle that make it less competitive. And immigration and the visa system is one example of that. Um, because even if their home countries of India, China, wherever, weren't now offering new opportunities um, that incentivize them to go home after graduating, they wouldn't be getting visas, they wouldn't be getting green cards. Uh, unless they were the very, very top, um, uh, uh, highest quality student. Um, and so I think that's, that's the self-inflicted nature of it. We can talk, this is a complex issue, innovation. I don't wish to <coughs> paint it in simple colours, but we can talk in Q&A about that um, uh, um, uh, after I finish talking. The third and final point, again, something um, that Rob and I have discussed um, and that um, I think has been the basis of my... Um, um, uh, of my rising concern about the mental condition of America, or the intellectual condition rather, um, of Washington in particular, is the fact that the um, assumptions we held in the lead up to 2007, 2008, um, the assumptions, many of which collapsed or should have collapsed in the rubble of Lehman Brothers, um, tend to persist um, to an extraordinary degree, the, the intellectual paradigm, if you like, that informed our world um, before this, this great recession, this great contraction, um, is remarkably robust, is remarkably stubborn, and has been remarkably little challenged if, 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 uh, if you judge against what maybe I, but others here as well, were expecting in 2008. Um, uh, now, in terms of America's intellectual crisis, I, I, don't, I don't wish to focus on uh, uh, the rise of the Tea Party, the condition of the Republicans um, in particular. I think a book from two uh, political scientists I greatly admire, Norm Ornstein and Thomas Mann, it's even worse than it looks, pretty much gets it right. This is an asymmetric polarization we're facing um, that is 
particularly paralyzing to government in, in, in the separation of powers system that you have. Um, I've just been in California, um, where I spent a long time with Jerry Brown, who um, called me on, on my cell phone about three weeks ago, having just read the book, and I couldn't get him off the phone. I, normally I spend hours trying to get governors on the phone. Um, <laughs> Jerry Brown is concerned about the Calif Californianization of American politics, <laughs> namely the paralysis. <laughs> Um, and uh, and we see what's they've happened. They've always been the leader. They've always been, they've always <laughs> been the future, which is the great fear. Um, uh, the intellectual crisis I focus on isn't isn't the political one, um, in terms of the rise of the Tea Party. Um, it's the much more mainstream one amongst um, what we could loosely, simplistically call the economics profession, the profession that told us that when China joined the WTO, America's deficit would shrink. Um, because China's market would open up the profession that gave us, of course, the efficient market hypothesis, which really should have died in the rubble of 08. Um, and the profession that now that we've got modest but still welcome declines in unemployment month by month in the last few months, although the last two or three have been particularly anemic and troubling, uh, um, that told us uh, that um, the productivity growth should be matched by, by wage growth. Now, we've had extraordinary productivity gains, if the numbers are to be believed, in the last few years, but wage growth continues um, to go down. Um, and so with each fresh business cycle, um, the market clears at a lower rate. People are rehired for less than what they were previously employed um, doing. Um, and this is not the expectation we would have had in the 1990s. Rob mentioned I was a speechwriter for Larry Summers. Um, in those days, everybody confidently felt that America was benefiting from this new and hyper-globalizing world um, because it was best placed, along with other highly advanced economies, to move up to the top of the value-added chain. Um, but if you look at the jobs that are being created, um, uh, if you look at the help wanted ads that are out, uh, are out there now, um, these are in food preparing. Um, they're in low-end retail. Um, they're in low-end service um, sector jobs. They don't come with pension or health benefits. Um, they tend to be, even to the extent there are manufacturing jobs being recreated, the two-tier kinds of jobs that are more like $15 an hour, not $35 an hour. They're not the jobs that are going to create the aggregate demand that is the source of growth in the American economy. And this is where my Latin Americanization point intersects with my competitiveness point. Um, uh, namely, that 70% of growth in the US comes from consumer spending. Um, to the extent the growth that's generated goes to the top 1%, whose propensity to spend is close to zero because they already have what they need, uh, more than what they need. To the extent, therefore, that the remaining X percent, whichever number you choose, um, are either getting stagnant income or falling income, you are undermining the principal motor of the American economy. Um, so um, you are weakening the motor of the uh, principal motor of the American economy. Um, and I think that's a really important point to stress. There have been many books that have focused on what I call the triple cocktail of medium wage stagnation, rising inequality and um, uh, declining income mobility, that particularly un-American phenomenon that you're experiencing of being less mobile even than countries like Britain. Um, uh, they tend to focus, quite understandably, and I share a lot of their sentiment, on the unfairness of it all. Um, what I focus it on is the competitiveness consequences of this. What it tells us about America's relatively um, challenged competitiveness in this, in this world, um, but also what it tells us um, about um, how the political system which I think you'll agree is becoming more oligarchic, um, particularly in, in the uh, um, wake of the Citizens United ruling. Um, what it tells us about the political system's willingness and ability to act counter-cyclically against these trends. Um, it's really acting pro-cyclically. And that, I think, is a source of deep concern. Um, and the United States is a land of equality of opportunity. That was its foundational creed. Um, as I say, pragmatism was its foundational philosophy. Um, and 
I guess, the spirit of my book. I've given you the very dry, intellectual sort of abstract of it, but the spirit of my book, if I had to uh, source one essence, it would be my concern about America's inability to take practical decisions in the face of these challenges. Um, uh, my mother says one Prozac per chapter, um, but I think actually... <laughs> Um, a correct diagnosis is an uplifting thing. I think it's an energizing thing. And I do think, I'm biased, of course, that this is a correct diagnosis of where America is. It's by no means an exhaustive one. Um, but I think, it's, I think it's pointing in the right direction. Um, so having spared you the, the full mother-length talk, I'll hand it, hand it back to Rob. All right. Uh, there's going to be shots of tequila in the back. <laughs> <laughs> One of the reasons I like Ed so much is he's, you know, we, we, we share misery um, <laughs> so well together because um, I actually have the same diagnosis or we do and uh, very close, to them, I should say. And uh, But I also share your view that the only way out of this uh, challenge is you have to understand and accept where we are first. That's the first step to taking action. And one of the things we say in this book we have coming out is uh, we, we seem to have this inability to do that. and. Um, one of the things that when there are a number of reviews, of, uh, and there's one that I responded to with a blog that's back there, but uh, they, they simply sort of just rejected your thesis because they, clearly you don't understand that America is exceptional. Um, we've never declined. We've always been the best. We're, it's, it's in our DNA. Uh, I was had the pleasure last night of being at the Washington um, Economics Club, the 25th uh, anniversary forum or whatever, and they had uh, uh, Warren Buffett who you can have nothing but respect for, um, but uh, David Rubenstein asked Warren Buffett, what do you think about the future of America? And he said, uh, I think the future of America is fantastic. Um, it's in our DNA. It was a sta it's almost like our operating system, our 1776 operating system is just guaranteed to continue to produce wealth. Now, I thought about that, and I thought two things. I thought one is... Um, because he was talking about how the stock market went up from 65 to 11,000 in a century. And I was like, I thought you would be a good person to say past performance is no guarantee of future success. Um, and secondly, it goes back to your point. I think I would think that Warren Buffett might be among those 15,600 families. Um, and so I probably don't disagree with them that sort of in general equity markets probably are going to continue to do. Well, that's quite a different thing. And so I'm wondering how you would respond to that. Or, I mean, how do you see this kind of exceptionalist? It's, you know, we're just better than you Brits because uh, Magna Carta is not as good as the Declaration of Independence. Well, I'd agree with that, Ben. <laughs> Although it was a good start, the Magna Carta. Um, I, I mean, it, it's, it's a complex issue, and I don't think Warren Buffett clearly didn't do full justice to, to, to that. Um, the United States remains, if you're an innovator, a great place to be headquartered. And, and it's as, as I say, it's hard to imagine Germany producing a Twitter or, or Mexico producing a Facebook. Um, uh, it's also hard, though, to see how the, these kinds of valuations are going to be justified. Um, it's certainly hard to see. I mean, I've noticed Sheryl Sandberg, CEO of Facebook, has this number that uh, it's created 450,000 jobs indirectly through app developers. Now, I think this is a slightly controversial number. Not many people agree um, with her. Um, but uh, I wonder how many of those app developers are living in Bangalore or in Seoul um, or, in other, or in other places. Um, and I wonder how many of those app developers are actually generating income from being app developers. I know a few, you know, the beer one and this talking tomcat that my daughter, daughter tortures me with on my iPad. I, I know a few have struck it very rich, but I don't think this is regular income for most people. I think people hear stories about a, a single app making million, making making you a millionaire, and they try and develop other apps, which isn't to say there isn't a great deal of innovation going on. Um, the question is, is, is this a substitute for the broader Production. I don't like to say manufacturing because I think there's a false distinction between services and manufacturing. But the broader high value added production that America ought to be attracting, um, and I don't, and I don't think, uh, I, I don't think that uh, the fact that America produced Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs is always the answer um, that I get to the points I'm making, and I agree with the answer. I just don't think it's anywhere near complete. Um, so you know, I think America could be. Um, 
it, it's a great place to be a large scale um, uh, global company with innovative capacity. Um, uh, but it's not that great a place to be um, involved in many other kinds of production. Um, and ultimately, you know, uh, being able to keep a middle class gainfully employed is what I think forms a bedrock, not just of demand, but of a democracy. And the, um, the, the political pathology of failing to do that gets worse over time. Yeah. And even the goose that lays the golden eggs finds that her, uh, her, her nest gets ruffled. Yeah, I was just I was at breakfast this morning with Walter Isaacson, and, and he actually made a really interesting point from his book on uh, Steve Jobs. And he said that um, you know when Jobs initially established Apple, he built a factory in Fremont, and, and you hear this sort of view of Apple. Well, you know they they really like this outsource model, and and he at least uh, Eric, um, Walter said that uh, Jobs actually actually felt that was uh, detrimental to the U.S. Uh, and, and and maybe to Apple that, that they, they would have rather been able to have a supply chain domestically, but for a number of different problems, including our engineering talent and, and other factors, that he wasn't able to do that. So even the Steve Jobs example is not really a good example. And so even Steve Jobs admits that there should be we should be able to do more and, and deeper and broader and better. Yeah, um, the, there's a really good um, Harvard Harvard Business Review study that you've probably seen in the last um, couple of months that uh, that um, surveys 10,000 uh, alumni fr from, from Harvard Business School, um, all of whom are involved either owning or at senior levels managing um, companies in the private sector. Um, and overwhelming proportion expect America's competitiveness to continue to deteriorate. And an overwhelming proportion in terms of reporting their own company's activities showed that R&D jobs were being located three to one outside of the United States. And that kind of <coughs> trade deficit in terms of the highest end service sector jobs you can think of, research and development, often, of course, attached to manufacturing, which is why I don't really like to make that distinction, um, it is continuing to go to, 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 to head the wrong way. And I think, you know, I think they, they, they are more important and alarming measures than, than where Steve Jobs is from and the fact that he probably couldn't be from anywhere else. Yeah. So one of the things that I thought was a valuable contribution of your book was it wasn't just a book about how things are problematic. It was an explanation of why we haven't been able to act, why we haven't been able to muster the political will to really take on and, and step up to this problem, as we have so many times throughout our history. And um, one of the points that you make in this, uh, and, and you really make it well by going out and interviewing people uh, like Larry Summers and Austin Goolsby, but you could have interviewed, uh, and maybe you did, I don't remember, a uh, you know, Republican economist and I found the exact same thing. But there's a quote in there from Summers that says, strictly speaking, nations don't compete. Uh, the quote from Goolsby about, forget about having a, an equivalent to the Singapore Economic Development Board of the U.S., we just don't work this way. And again, if you had a Republican administration, you'd hear the exact same thing. Uh, this, to me, is a big problem. It's a big barrier to us taking important steps. And you want to just say a little more of what kind of maybe what your experiences were when you interviewed high-level officials and how they inter how they responded? Yeah, I should say, I mean, I'll focus on Larry Summers, I, I, but I should say that you know, it was an enormous privilege to be a speechwriter to him, his speechwriter, and, and um, he's a brilliant man, and I learned an extraordinary amount. I don't fully agree with him um, on the way the economy is going. I don't even fully agree with people like Paul Krugman, because um, I think their supposition is that there's nothing structurally wrong, that this is essentially a macroeconomic problem, and if we see the response of economists, and the economist, in fact, to um, last Friday's payroll numbers, the panic that demand is once again going out of the U.S. economy. Um, the overwhelming consensus is, look, we should just get uh, Ben Bernanke to double the inflation expectations, just temporarily, although not admitting it's temporary, otherwise it would be ineffective, double the inflation target from 2 to 4%. And at the stroke of a pen, the hydraulic machine will work once again as it should always work, or if you like to think of it as a car. And I think Larry Summers was actually on uh, Morning Joe this morning. He used this analogy. We need to get more engine in the tank. Um, and then the supposition would be the car would work as normal. But the point is it's not working as, as normal. And um, it isn't simply a demand problem. It would be nice to think it is and that a, a single sentence out of the FOMC could address it. 
um, but it isn't. Um, and I think there are all sorts of microeconomic and structural um, difficulties, not least in the relative skill set of the American middle class, but also in terms of America's um, non-response or ideological posture in, um, in reaction to what other countries are doing, either WTO compatible or not WTO compatible. Um, it, turns on, it turns the US into what my colleague Martin Moore calls the great global patsy, you know, in a system where mercantilism, in a global trading regime where mercantilism is the norm, maybe to use a too strong a word, um, but mercantilism for, for, for the sake of brevity, um, you need one great patsy that has its markets open as the importer of the last resort for the whole system to keep going. At some stage, that patsy um, realizes that the game is not a net benefit. Um, and uh, and then the whole system comes into question. I very much hope that in these sort of 1930s sort of echoes we're getting from Europe, that moment isn't soon, um, because we are at a very precarious moment. But the fact that you know we haven't shifted um, uh, the emphasis of economic policy back to in investment and away from consumption, um, uh, and and the fact that these sort of fundamental reforms are really nowhere near to being implemented, some of them are being discussed, um, is I think profoundly disturbing. And I would hold econo economists um, the sort of arrogant sweep of pen response they have to these um, to these challenges um, very much accountable for that mindset. And it's a damaging mindset. It's a complacent mindset, um, and it served America badly. It's a good opportunity to provide a small commercial if you actually want to get into that a little more. We have a we had a little uh, website innovationeconomics.org where we have this um, argument uh, that we made uh, with our colleague um, um, David Adresh, an economist, that, that there are these doctrines of economic thinking, and, and one of them is this neoclassical economics. Anyway, there's a fun little test you can take on the website. It takes you six minutes, and you'll find out whether you're more like Larry Summers or. Um, Art Laffer or uh, Keynes or Schumpeter, and it's kind of fun to say. Um, but I think the problem is we have too many economists like Art Laffer and and uh, and and, uh, and Bob Rubin. Actually, that's who it is. Bob Rubin is the picture that pops up, and not enough like Schumpeter. Um, so one last question before I open it up. Um, you know, if you think about what the real agenda has to be to get America economically on track, and I'm going to leave out just for a minute the distributional questions, because it's not really uh, our wheelhouse, but the kind of competitiveness uh, and, and economic growth part. Um, it's not super hard to figure out what to do. Uh, I mean, it's okay, we got to focus on high skill immigration. We got to cut taxes on corporations, particularly those that are globally traded, and raise taxes on individuals. Mm -hmm. We got to raise taxes uh, in order to afford more public investment in things like research and training and skills. And we got to cut spending on things like uh, health care, uh, and then we got to make people work longer. Uh, that is a guaranteed a solution to not get elected. <laughs> uh, anyway, what, what, uh, I'm going to make your life miserable. Oh, by the way, I'm going to I'm going to help those big corporations. Uh, I mean, I, I'm saying this to somebody in there, one political person. Look, I look at me like, are you crazy? You can't say that. And so fundamentally, it goes back to really who the American public are, and. I guess maybe we can talk a little bit about that. I thought you had some really interesting insights about how the American public has, in some ways, is to blame for this. It's sort of a maybe, you know, reverse cause, multiple causation. Maybe they feel this way because of the inequality and they're hunkered down. But at some point, the American public has to take some responsibility for the political system that we are and, and, and a willingness to bite the bullet and say, you know what? We are going to suffer some short-term harm so that we can get longer-term, mid-term benefit for our children. And that doesn't seem to be anywhere near on the radar screen today. So do you want to talk about that? And the, the classic, the very good question, the classic way of letting the American public off the hook is to talk about gerrymandering. That essentially the party elites in whichever states they control are redrawing boundaries, district boundaries, to benefit and their own parties, thereby handing control from the swing voter to the party activist because it's the primary that really matters in these safe seats. And I think the response to that is look at Senate elections. They're just as polarized. And nobody's been fiddling with state boundaries, as far as I can tell. Polarization is not about gerrymandering. Um, polarization is not something concocted 
Um, I think, you know, by morally dubious characters who get sent to Washington who then get Washingtonized. I think this, this sort of tendency to hold Washington to blame um, for things that are very clearly, um, trends that are very clearly rooted outside of the Beltway, um, uh, in not just the American economy, but in American sociology, um, is, is, is a way of not facing up to the problem. Um, and uh, the problem, you know, can be described on many levels, but there is polarization going on in American society. Um, some of this is to do with ethnic changes um, and to do with ethnic demography. Um, you know, Jerry Brown, when he talks about, you know, the inability to get anything done in California, he's essentially facing a Republican Party that's become an Anglo party in that state, as it's referred to and as it's referred to in Texas. Um, that has the means under the California Constitution um, to ensure a tyranny of the minority. In other words, blocking anything anybody can do now. There are a lot more reasons for California's dysfunction than just that. Bill Bishop, um, who, who wrote a very interesting book four or five years ago um, called The Big Sort, shows how Americans are sorting themselves out into neighborhoods and zip codes with others in their socioeconomic brackets. Charles Murray, on the other end of the political spectrum, focuses on the same phenomenon with very different <coughs> remedies and very different explanations as to why it's happening, but essentially provides the same snapshot that Americans are choosing not to live together. And this has very political consequences, you know, not just in who you listen to or don't listen to, which of course is reinforced by trends in the media, um, uh, but, but in um, you know, where candidates running for national office or state office are going to focus their time. Um, the, uh, the, the mythical sort of swing voter, the mythical Socratic middle um, is even less relevant than it once was. And I think this is chiefly and principally to do with the, the way Americans <coughs> are behaving in, in the real world, in, 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 in not, not as voters, but as people. Um, and that, I guess, is a source of some of my pessimism. Um, that if this were simply about, you know, a corrupt system of drawing district boundaries, then we could imagine a scenario where it's going to be easily fixed. Some things are easily fixable. I think the immigration system can easily be fixed. It, um, education can't be. That's a deep challenge, and it's taken decades to get into this um, K through 12 problem, and it might well take decades to get out. Um, but by and large, I would agree with the premise of your question that it's not hard to imagine a lot of things, what, what should be done, you know, in terms of research and development and a more muscular public sector partnership with the private sector, bridging the valley of death, all that kind of stuff, immigration, infrastructure, having a, um, a public-private infrastructure bank. Um, really not that hard to imagine at least some remedies to these deep-seated problems. The difficulty is imagining them happening. That's where the difficulty exists. It's imagining um, them being carried out in practice. Um, and so I think you've identified quite correctly the source, the source of the political paralysis. It's like Pogo. Mm -hmm. We've met the enemy and he is us. Right. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. So why don't we open it up? Uh, if you want to raise your hand, identify yourself. Hi, my name is George Cook with Toyota. It seems that in the post-industrial world up until the 1980s, the path to the middle class was fostered on building stuff, manufacturing, right? You go into the, you go into the factories, you build stuff, you have a tangible product. Uh, the U.S. economy boomed, specifically post-World War I, World War II. And there was not only just the ability to make product and to base an economy on that, but there was an, uh, an, an attitude that came from that. So there was a belief in, you know, that blue-collar job. There was going to work every day, making things but respecting and representing the needs of the workers to get good wages, you know, to have fair, uh, a fair atmosphere and environment for working, things like that. Make these steps to make the working life better. Then you get to the 1980s, and then all of a sudden it seems that the blue-collar job isn't as respected, isn't as appreciated. Now everybody has to go to college, and your parents tell you, in order for you to succeed, you have to have a college degree. So now you have this you know, generation and a half of people who now felt that it was much more necessary to go to University of Maryland and get an art history degree, and then not really be employable after that, or to go into this white collar world. So now in America, it seems that you have this, this <coughs> surplus of people who are lawyers or who have MBAs and all these white collar positions. And so now we're all competing to go and work in offices, and you have this you know, lapse of folks who are willing to go in 
and get that $70,000 a year job in the middle of Georgia building something and have those jobs, because those jobs do exist in America. There are those manufacturing positions, but they just can't find people to fill them. So either you just don't have the folks who have that specific skill set, or they can't pass the drug test. It's one or the other. So <laughs> what what is, how do we stop in America and, and kind of reevaluate and say, you know what, it's not about that over intellectualizing maybe, I don't know if that's a, a, a good term for it, but this emphasis on living that white collar, everybody go to the office kind of job and say, look, there's another life out there. And that other life is just as valuable <coughs> and actually will help us create an anchor for our economy again. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are a lot of questions in there. Just just to pick on the last sentence, that life, uh, as in the white collar life or the... Uh, or the For the blue collar, doing the blue collar. The blue collar. Life. Okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah, no, no, now I get your question. Um, I just think, I mean, you know, it might well be that the, the golden era that, that we do hear a lot discussed, understandably, that is now vanishing, you know, 1950s, 60s, 70s America of a mass blue collar labor force. It's a little bit romantic to expect us to sort of bring that back. And I think it would involve... You know, subsidies that in, in this age of uh, austerity possibly can't be afforded to, to lure um, particularly the lower value added ones back to the US. Um, uh, uh, but, you know, the American labor force is not being re equipped for the new kinds of jobs um, that America could be attracting. And I think far greater numbers, R&D, of course, is, is one example. And I think, you know, to, to, to go back to the political system. Right now, what we have in, in terms of the fiscal debate and in terms of action in the last two, three years is a freezing of that 15% of the federal budget that you've called the domestic uh, non-defense discretionary spending. Um, and essentially, a continuation of normal uh, spending rates uh, for the remainder of the budget. Um, defense has supposedly been um, cut, but actually it, from a very generous baseline, so even defense hasn't been cut. The only area where there's consensus to freeze has been domestic a discretionary budget. Um, and that's the bit that includes R&D, education, infrastructure. That's the bit what I like to call tomorrow bit of the budget. The yesterday bit of the budget is safe. The tomorrow bit, bit of the budget it is unsafe. Uh, well, it's, it's shrinking. Um, now, uh, this is precisely the time, given how you fund community colleges, um, principally from local property taxes, given how you fund schools, school districts, principally from local um, taxes in those districts um, <coughs> and in the states, um, their budgets are shrinking inevitably because we've had a housing meltdown. So this is precisely the time where pragmatic fiscal policy in the centre will be channeling money to these um, institutions, the community colleges as well, um, because they are most in demand. People have lost their jobs. People need to be re-equipped and re-skilled. And yet what we've seen is a cutting of those budgets at a time where they've taken on far more enrollees. Um, and I think that, you know, again, that's a very, that's a very disturbing sign. I would agree with the premise of your question um, that, um, that there is great dignity and there's still a future in blue collar labor. But there's also got to be a much bigger and brighter future in white collar labor than, um, than is currently being provided for. Here in Hi, I'm Greg Sheffman from the University of Central Florida. And uh, Rob, actually, I was hoping this was going to be a campaign announcement. You know, Atkinson, 2000 something. Uh, <laughs> I'm like Ed, I was born outside this country. You, actually, you? Rob, you used, you used a word um, that I use with my daughter, who's a sophomore in high school, 16, responsibility. I don't even say that word anymore. Now I just say the R word, because responsibility just gets her riled too much. And Governor Malley uh, has said there's uh, a slogan of uh, spend less, live better. And that only works for one place. It may work for Walmart. It doesn't work in the public sector. You're talking about all the things that we need to do, and I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, as a former community college trustee and everything else, I absolutely. We spend a lot of time here on Washington trying to get them to understand, but it seems to me that part of it, maybe more of it, because of Citizens United and other things, that maybe it's Wall Street that we need to focus on and help them understand that those quarterlies aren't going to help America avoid decline, that perhaps it's something about not punishing companies from thinking long term and not having those short term profits. So maybe do you think that we need to? not 
redirect some of the attention, at least make Wall Street part of the the lobbying focus of what we need to do in order to achieve what you're talking about. Yeah, yes, I would. Uh, um, uh, Rob, you could run for governor of California, of course. You know, that would be what outside of it. Um, uh, I, I, I would agree entirely. I don't think that Dodd Frank goes far enough, but it, evidently it went too far um, from the point of view of Wall Street. I tend to see Wall Street as um, the swing vote um, in terms of campaign funding, um, where you know the mineral extraction industry is very much Republican entertainment, IT is very much Democrat, and Wall Street's the swing vote between those two, and that swing is very much towards Mitt Romney. Um, this time, unlike in 08, when of course Obama took um, the bulk of Wall Street donations. And and that is mostly in re reaction to what um, uh, Jamie Dimon and others see as the betrayal um, by President Obama, um, not just because of Dodd-Frank, um, which I find mystifying, because Dodd-Frank leaves too big to fail. In fact, too big to fail have got bigger. Um, and their share of banking assets has got larger, the top 10 banks. Um, but also in response to the rhetoric that um, President Obama has occasionally deployed, not you know during the AIG bonus scandal and at other points, and so I find that slightly mystifying because I think I think Dodd Frank, um, uh, you know, at a watered down Volcker rule, essentially essentially lets Wall Street off the hook. Um, there are two issues there: the financialization of the economy, the retreat of the disappearance of patient capital which refer, it refers back a little bit to what I was talking about earlier uh, in Silicon Valley. And Larry Summers says patient capital can often be dumb capital. And that's true also. And I imagine there's lots of overinvestment and dumb projects in China that might 10 years from now look like wasted investments. But I think there's also quite a lot of smart stuff going on in China at the same time. And you take the rough with the smooth. Um, you, you take the good with the bad. Um, and the Wall Street metric, the Wall Street time horizon, the fact that we do have an industrial policy in this country for Wall Street. Um, if you look at the panoply of um, loopholes and um, re regulations there that um, the Wall Street, um, the Wall Street lobby uh, effort has managed to get in even into the Dodd-Frank rule writing process. Um, if you look at the overarching bias in favor of leverage that hasn't changed, since 2008, it might at a regulatory level be tougher now, it's not 30 to 1, but you get tax write-offs for debt and you don't for equity. Um, that is um, uh, a very damaging policy to America's economic self-interest and I think I'd largely laid at the door of the influence of Wall Street, so I couldn't agree with you more. Imagining how and when and who will overcome Wall Street and change the system um, and um, you know rejig the incentives that are sent from the federal tax system um, is more difficult than agreeing with your premise, which I find very easy to do. It's amazing Larry Summers can make statements like that. I know you have to be friendly with him, but um, <laughs> so the smart capital was what Jamie Dimon invested recently. <laughs> that was the smart capital. Really smart. Uh, I actually went probably in order. We'll go here, here, and then here. James saying I've been retired. Um, there's certainly a lot to be pessimistic here. I'm a little surprised when I talk to my foreign friends how pessimistic they are everywhere. My European friends, obviously. But my Indian friends, who were a couple of years ago very optimistic, are now very pessimistic about their government and think it could screw things up royally. Even my Chinese friends, I have a couple of friends who are associated with you know, getting to 200 million, 200 million college graduates in the year 2020. And when they look at the problems that they're going to have getting there, they get very, very pessimistic on a variety of grounds. So I have a feeling there seems to be an awful lot of pe pessimism in the world. Is that one of the things that's going to save us? The rest of the world is in, in the steel wall stuff? So? Oh, this is a very good question. I mean, you know, if, if, if you could find one large democracy more dysfunctional right now in the US, it would be India. Um, you know, the, the reform process there is ground to a halt. The process of building coalitions between multiple ethnic groups, linguistic groups, caste groups, um, is even more difficult and even more painstaking and even more um, fraught with um, uh, fragmentary uh, um, danger than it is in the United States. Um, and so I understand the pessimism in a country like India, Europe, we don't need to elaborate on. Um, even China. Um, China though, um, let me um, just pick up on something. I, I went to China a few weeks ago. Um, the FT does this annual thing called the Great FT Debates, and they coincide with 
um, the annual literary festivals back to back, Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong, and we hold debates in each of them that are amazingly well attended. And the debate this year was that, China, uh, that, that America's decline, China's rise comes at America's expense, I think. And I was, uh, I was arguing, I was fairly flippant, Oxbridge sort of debating <laughs> format. And I was, um, I'm sure, fairly flippantly arguing um, for the motion. Um, and uh, at the beginning of the debate, there was a vote. And then at the end, there's a vote. And if you move the needle, however much you've lost it at the beginning, if you move the needle, you've won. And I never moved the needle from 80 to 20, 20 against. But most Chinese are very pessimistic um, <coughs> that they will really take on the United States um, because it lacks democracy. Uh, equally, I think if you held a debate in Ohio, you'd probably get 80 20 the other way. Um, Jeff Immelt, you know, says if you put globalization to a referendum in America, it would lose, hands down, and I think he's probably right. Um, and I found this paradoxically to be a great source of optimism, that the, the level of self-criticism around the world, including in America, is pretty high. Uh, and you know, I think people are questioning, they're not finding answers yet, but we're no longer in a stage of denial um, that, um, you know, that, that there's obviously something awry with the way economics is serving the vast majority of people. Um, all I would add, though, there about China is that every year since I can remember, people have been predicting China's implosion and China's collapse. Um, and I'm not sure whether that's, you know, a correct expectation given um, what's happened in other parts of um, its neighborhood. Um, you know, I first went to China in the 80s and it was a totalitarian country. There were loudspeakers everywhere. You couldn't turn them off. Um, blaring propaganda 24 hours a day. And now that's all gone. You know, I didn't see one woman wearing makeup. I know this isn't you know, the great measure of whether a country is a democracy or not, but there wasn't any individuality. And now, of course, it's an entirely in consumer terms, free, free country. Um, and that's a shift from totalitarianism to authoritar authoritarianism. It's a big, big shift. Um, at the same time as many of its neighbours have shifted from authoritarianism to democracy without bloodshed, without great ruptures. Um, and so I think the supposition that China is going to have some sort of great political rupture and or economic meltdown is, is one that has to be justified. It's, it's, not, it's not necessarily um, what you'd expect if you look at the history of, of, of the region. Um, and so I think China is becoming more democratic or less undemocratic as time goes on. People focus on social media. The Chinese um, Twitter, Weibo, you know, has hundreds of millions of people on it. Um, and the fact that if the word jasmine gets used, you know, that it gets shut down, certain things, words get banned. Um, but um, it's also an extraordinary tool of expression and of spreading ideas and of spreading dissent. Um, and of the Chinese government's ability to read where public mood is going and anticipate it and respond to it and behave as if it were a permanent campaign, even though they're never subject to election. So China is changing quite rapidly. Um, and um, I think the pessimism is in China, amongst Chinese, is a very healthy sign. Uh, I think we had one here. Sorry, let me try to keep the questions and the answers a little Sorry, short. We know that, but I'll just try to get them anyway, right. Ernie Preet, Manufacturers Alliance. Uh, my question is about manufacturing, particularly yes. the growing trade deficit, which went up by 48 billion last year, a net loss of 200 to 400,000 mm -hmm. manufacturing jobs. And it's going up even faster this year, toward 500 billion, the Chinese and others in the other direction. Uh, in fact, pardon me short, I, I do have a book coming out in a month or two called The Decline and Fall of Bread and Woods, question mark. Mm -hmm. So my question there is, in fact, one part of it, which is exchange rates. Exchange rate manipulation is defined by the IMF. And uh, one just very quick point, uh, I'm guilty of, uh, uh, of the old phrase that uh, 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 consistency is the hobgoblin, hobgoblin of small minds. Not just 10 years of Chinese, but 40 years. Because in August 71, I was in the 72 car of State Department when we said to the European allies in Japan, you're manipulating your currency and you got to stop and go to market rates and we're going to put a 10% import surcharge on you today, which will go up unless you change. And they changed. And the intellectual leaders, too, wasn't me, was Paul Volcker, Treasury, and Fred Bergsten, who was the senior advisor to, uh, to Kissinger. 
uh, so uh, my question is, where do we? How important is this, uh, the, as defined by IMF Article Four, the currency manipulation uh, today? And shouldn't it be center stage, as it was back in '71, and the, as the main factor in what's been happening to, to make us the import of last resort? To your, use the phrase that you, that you hear about, which is where we are today. I think it's very important, and um, I think I can understand why it hasn't been treated um, as very important by successive U.S. administrations. If you look at the way the business... State Department was totally cut out in '71 mm -hmm. because Treasury and the White House knew the Secretary of State would bring its hands about. NATO allies. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm, I can witness that. I'm sure the State Department on this occasion will be with Treasury, though. You know, I mean, now there's pretty much unity. Yeah, everybody's in a state of denial. Uh, conventional wisdom is that we shouldn't rock the boat on on the on the currency uh, the problem with China. And conventional wisdom is that because of China's demographic problem, that people are going to be retiring in in a, a, in a large scale. That their own premature baby boom consequence of a one-child policy is going to incentivize them to move towards doing this anyway in their own self-interest because retired people tend to spend rather than save and what we need is more saving in America and less saving in China to rebalance and I think that all these suppositions uh, combine to um, prevent action um, on the currency um, there is as Larry Summers is called mutually assured destruction here though um, between the US and China they are kind of in the same boat um, and, um, you know, simply starting a trade war with China, I, 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 don't, I don't think is going to, is going to fix, is going to fix these problems. I think they're more deeply rooted just in the currency valuation. It has been going in the right direction very, very mildly until the last two, three weeks. Their productivity is in the teens in manufacturing. Well, why don't we go next question? Yeah. Uh, Kevin, and then... Um, Kevin Finner at the National Academy of Sciences. Um, you began um, by talking about um, two trends. One, the, the relatively shrinking share of the U.S. share of the global economy. And the other was the sort of disparity in income, and spread and disparity of income. And it seems to me that the, 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 the sort of shrinking share of the economy, of the global economy, isn't a problem. It's almost inevitable. I mean, if you look, we had this tremendous head start coming out of World War II when there was a certain amount of momentum that held us. So I don't know that that's a, a, a cause for concern. I'm also curious about to what extent... No, I was simply simply yeah. responding to those who are saying it isn't happening. Um, the other question is, though I, I mean, I share your concern about income distribution, but it's, it's, I'd like to know how you make the connection between um, you know, the disparity in, in rewards and the overall productivity and competitiveness of the U.S. economy. Um, you can, I can see how they can be linked, and sometimes they're correlated. But if you're thinking about how do you frame policy in a way to make people see this, these questions as somehow connected, I'd like to know how you do that. Yeah, very, very briefly, because I know Rob wants quick, quicker answers, and I agree with him. Um, first, in terms of uh, aggregate demand, the point I was making, if the U.S. economy has a, a slower consumer spending, that it has slower overall growth. And second, in the impact that these trends have on the behavior of the political system. Americans are far more turned off by politics um, because they don't feel that, you know, when, when, when commentators and politicians tell them they're having a recovery, and technically they are having a recovery, um, uh, when most, uh, the, when the aggregate economy is in recovery and most Americans aren't, or a large bulk of, a large share of Americans aren't, they're going to, continuing through their personal recessions. I think this changes political behavior. I think it makes most people more apathetic um, at a time when um, the party activists in each party, particularly in the Republican Party, are less apathetic. And so there's a sort of gradual shift in terms of trade, if you like, from the apathetic or from the swing voter to the activist or to the extremist. And that has a big impact on American competitiveness because it lowers the quality of governance. Um, so those would be the two. Those would be the two impacts. I, I got everybody on the list, and I'm going in order. So yes, ma'am, right back. Okay, thank you, um, Megan Jones, Mercator Twenty One. I was hoping that you could tell me, in this state of political and economic gridlock, what disruptive force do you think could break the political and economic gridlock? And do you think it will be the political or economic system that needs to shift first, so that way America can increase its competitiveness? Well, events may force, you know, I mean, talk about these things very abstractly, but events, you know, the fiscal cliff, tax Mageddon, whatever you like to call it, the mother of all lame ducks <laughs> after November, um, as I think going to 
concentrate minds um, wonderfully and you know gaming that out is very very difficult it depends who wins the presidential it depends who's in control <coughs> of the um, two houses I'm inclined to believe that if Romney wins and he would therefore probably have at least one half of Capitol Hill probably both both chambers Republican um, that there won't be a mother of all lame ducks they'll just kick the can down to February March at which point we'll get a major tax cuts both corporate and personal um, we will get quite large defence spending boost. Um, we probably won't get the, the domestic discretionary spending cuts that are meant to come with it. Um, and so we might well get a short-term stimulative boom coming out of Romney, um, but a much a, a longer-term deepening of the problem um, of um, the quality of policy making coming out of Washington if Obama wins. God knows there are some there are some really drastic scenarios there if Obama wins and the Republicans retain control of the House, and that could be where the reckoning really does become a reckoning and credit rating downgrades really start to come become a normal feature of the American system. Um, sorry, that was just a very. Okay, I'm get an order here, here, and then here, right here, sir. So. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Christopher Krauss. I'm from the National Environmental Education Foundation. Mm -hmm. the, um, Rob, you mentioned that raising uh, raising personal income taxes and lowering corporate income taxes is a good recipe for not getting elected. Um, this morning there was a National Journal event and there was a senior member of Congress who framed the tax issue as maybe trying to reframe and massage the issue so it's not so much about taxing individuals so much as about taxing things that you don't want. Use the example of carbon taxes. There's also short-term income taxes um, or short-term capital gains taxes. Um, to what extent can maybe changing the entire tax system gain some sort of, I mean, not changing the entire tax system, but doing more of a focus on taxing those things that we don't want to stimulate investment and things that we do want that might be a way to kind of get out of this, you know, this trap of, you know, tax or, or cut, you know, if we could, you know, come up with some sort of a system where we do have a, you know, a little more efficient way of allocating how. I think lots could happen. come from tax reform, comprehensive tax reform. It could be in a major, I mean, that's the third scenario in answer to the, uh, your, the previous questioner, um, which could be a very positive scenario is that this really does panic people into uh, you, you know, making uh, making compromise that would benefit the American economy and getting rid of the um, getting rid of the loopholes or at least phasing them out on both the corporate and personal um, tax side would be immensely immensely beneficial for the efficiency of the American system. The area where I would slightly disagree with Rob is, I mean, I think American big corporations pay very low taxes because they can afford accountants and they can afford lawyers and they can afford lobbyists who skew little obscure bits of the code in their favor. And GE, of course, is a classic example. They dispute the number, but essentially they paid zero tax in 2010. Um, uh, small businesses just can't get away with that and medium-sized businesses can't get away with that. Their, their tax rates tends to be amongst the highest in the world, but the uh, corporate tax in the world, but the real effective tax rate for big American companies is amongst the lowest in the world. And I think that distinction is quite an important one. And I think comprehensive tax reform could address could could address that and many other things, the fact that we're subsidizing, you know, your second home and it isn't and and uh, you know accretion and topographical um, uh, chaos, uh, well not chaos, but top topographical inefficiency um, is one way of putting it, the fact that you know the top ten percent get most of these subsidies most of savings subsidies, they get most of um, uh, mortgage subsidies, um, and healthcare insurance subsidies. This is, a, this is um, again, not counter-cyclical. This is actually a, a tax system that reinforces those who are benefiting from the private economy. And I think a comprehensive tax reform could make, make America competitive and fairer at the same time. And I don't see the two as being in opposition to each other. I see yeah. the two as being utterly hand in glove. And I think we're sort of now trained in the Pavlovian response to think fairness is uncompetitiveness and vice versa. It's not. The two go hand in glove. And if there's a lesson to take from what's happening in the rest of the world, Germany, um, uh, you know, in particular, or Singapore or Canada, it is precisely that, 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 that a rising tide does lift all boats or can and should. 
Yeah, so I had just a thing. I, I think here, I knew there had to be a one point we disagreed yeah. on. Since there's so <laughs> much consensus. I actually don't agree with, with the corporate side. I think if you look at what other countries are doing, um, and this is on our website, on, it just testified on Senate Finance on corporate tax incentives two months ago and made this in the testimony. <laughs> what other countries are doing is they are largely shifting their tax burden away from globally mobile activities to things that can't move. Uh, so largely through VAT. Mm-hmm. They've lowered their effective tax rates, they've raised their VAT. There's a study I will send you that just came out quite recently by NBER, the nice economist NBER, no axe to grind that I can be aware of. And he looked at effective corporate tax rates uh, for U.S. manufacturers and found they were the second highest among 20 countries. Um, so that's relatively new research, so I'm happy to okay, no, be send that along to see that. Uh, I think, boy, a lot of new hands. All right, so Patrick, you are you still in the queue here? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm at the risk of inviting an attack. I was going to say I'd love to debate you because it's it's a very nimble mind, and I, I enjoyed what you were saying, but I was going to push back a bit on your diagnosis about American politics. I lived in Europe for a long time, and one of the things I said to a friend about or, or the Tea Party movement, I said this would never happen in Europe. The idea that the largest, most powerful political group in the United States that's independent of a party, per se, is out protesting in the streets in favor of less, less spending, less entitlements, fewer programs, less government activity generally. The fact that that subgroup is the one that's the most active, and those are the crazies, and then the 80% of the rest of the public who are like, I want to continue to get everything I continue to get and pay less for it, those are the same people. And I just wonder what your reaction to that, particularly the comparison to Europe, where I can't imagine Whitehall filled with pensioners saying, reduce my benefits or cut the government spending on any, anything. No, I, I agree with you. I mean, I don't think Britain needed the Tea Party in order to have a, 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 a agenda of austerity, though. Britain, <laughs> Britain is in pre-self-inflicted double the recession now because of uh, an entirely inappropriate fiscal policy, pro-cyclical fiscal policy, when it should be counter-cyclical. You know, I mean, Keynes was British, and he seems to be deadest in Britain. You know, this is where I agree with <laughs> Summers, Krugman, etc. I just yeah, think it's that perfect. it's a necessary, not sufficient condition to have f- fiscal policy correct, and Britain's got it wrong. Rob and I were talking about your broader question about the Tea Party earlier, and I agree fully with Rob. Um, that you know there is method in the Tea Party madness if you look at it a different way, which is demographically. We're talking about an overwhelming white organization, white supported organizations. We're talking about high average age. Um, and if you look at the response to Obamacare, um, which was against extending it to people under 65 who are different from us, then I think um, there's a lot of method in that madness. It's perfectly explainable from an ethnic demographic point of view, the Tea Party movement. Yes, sir. Uh, I wanted to ask you about two components, how they fit into maybe where you think we went wrong and whether they're a piece of where we could go right in the future. Um, one component was the free trade policy that we adopted over the last couple of decades, whether that led to us losing all of these middle class jobs because uh, uh, things could be made more cheaply and brought directly in, or whether that was really a non-factor and we don't need to tweak it in the future. The second component was um, maybe whether uh, Al-Qaeda really did inflict something on us because since, as you point out, 2001, our military industrial complex has spent a huge amount of money uh, throwing money uh, into the Middle East, uh, destroying infrastructure in the Middle East, and then feeling we had to pay for it and fixing it up, okay. sending and you money. Pick, and sorry, then, Rick, I want to get one more point. Why don't you pick one of those? Why don't you pick the second one? Um, Al Qaeda. No, I mean you nine elevenized your visa and immigration system, and there's nothing more American than you know having a pragmatic immigration system, and it's become it's become a deeply paranoid um, system reflecting a country that's not, I don't think, um, thinking in in its right mind. Um, so I, I would agree with that. I do think, though, you mentioned Middle East. Um, I do think you know to 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 try and counteract a little bit of the, the gloom that. Um, I might be projecting. There is an extraordinary windfall going on in America in, in energy um, that you know is changing your your energy terms of trade in your favour um, quite quickly. Um, not just in terms of uh, you know the hydraulic fracking, not just in terms of um, tight oil and new technology can get oil cheaply that will at least 
cost effectively, not just in, in terms of um, you know the natural gas boom, um, uh, but, but but one that's, that could bring a big larger potential geopolitical dividend if America uses it as such. I don't know whether it will or won't, but you, you know the interests of balance. I should mention that not everything is going against America. So, very last question has got to be quick. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Ken Levinson at the Advocom Group. Um, just wondering if briefly could talk about maybe the role of technology and new media in the polarization and the personalization of news information, the direction that that's all headed. Uh, you know, with things like Facebook, where you're getting your information from your friends instead of from trusted. Uh, third-party sources. Um, it's such a huge subject, um, and th th I have so many disparate thoughts that I'm not sure whether I can do justice quickly or even slowly to your question. Is there any way you can narrow it down? The role of that in the political in polarization that we have right now. Yeah. Um, I think what I would tell you is what you already know, and I think I suspect I agree with the premise of your question. <laughs> But it makes it makes the, the the grand electronic echo chamber far easier to to subsist than than in the past. Walter Cronkite is dead, etc. Although I did tweet about your book, and I noticed that you retweeted it, which I thought was funny. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the only tweet you've ever retweeted of mine. And, uh, uh, no, uh, actually, it was the last comment I made on your book. It's the new. It's the new. It's the new polite phrase, isn't it? Instead of "thank you for sharing," it's "thank you for retweeting." Exactly. <laughs> so, and re-retweeting. <laughs> re-retweeting. Exactly. <laughs> anyway, um, so if you haven't read the book, uh, I think you can tell just from listening to Dad. I mean, really, uh, just wonderful insights and, and analysis, and uh, it's um, it's pretty cheap, isn't it? It's, uh, <laughs> It's only, you can get it in $26 and probably cheaper on Amazon. Um, <laughs> Definitely. I cheaper. really encourage you to get it. And, and uh, please join me in thanking Ed for both of us.